This uh, this movie, I will say, actually has a what today would be a decent cast. It's funny. Even the bit roles have actors that I've seen before. Mm-hmm. So it does have a really good cast because even the side roles, the very, very supporting roles, are all people. If I was watching the first time, the only person who I don't really know, per se. Moose Watson? Yeah, I don't really know Moose uh, Watson. Muse Watson, I don't really know what he's done before this, but I do know he's actually plays in a few in a good amount of episodes of NCIS. I swear I thought you were going to say Supernatural. I was about to lose my mind. <laughs> if he was a re- recurring guest on Supernatural, I was about to lose my mind. Every single podcast we do has some almost damn near Supernatural connection to the damn TV show Supernatural. And I think it's planned on Nick's behalf. If not, it's a hell of a coincidence. Right. Funny thing is, actually, from what I remember... None of these ca- none of these actors are in Supernatural. I don't oh, remember true. seeing any of them in there. The only person I really recognize from any other thing is Jennifer Love Hewitt from Boy Meets World. What? Yep, she was in the episode of Boy Meets World where a serial killer was going through the school, killing off her main cast because Corey and Topanga broke up. Okay, there's a very obvious thing we're missing, which is Sarah, Mich- Sarah Michelle Gellar is Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which actually was sort of... Supernatural before Supernatural, very similar show, is what I'm saying. Vampires. So we have that. Jeff Love, he was in Party of Five. She had her own show, too. That's fine. Surely you don't not know Party of Five. I don't. All right, it's a family Fox show from the 90s. That's why. And guess who it starred? It starred Jeff Love Hewitt and Nev Campbell from Scream. So it was like a a weird in-joke in the 90s where, like, Scream had Nev Campbell, and this was Jeff Love Hewitt, and they're both on the same TV show on Fox. Very odd indeed. Well, another thing, another people that this one has is uh, Freddie Prince Jr., which, to be honest, this is the only movie I've ever seen him in. You haven't seen She's All That? No. Uh, another Freddie, Freddie, Freddie Prince is actually, uh, outside of that, though, I'd say he's a famous actor for sure. He was in the Scooby-Doo movies. He had a run in the late 90s where he was in like a, kind of a, a teen heartthrob, so he's like in a, lot of, a few teen romantic comedies. He's a well-known name. The main four are all well-known people. Mm-hmm. Ryan Phillippe is very well-known. Yes, so. I definitely know him because he's actually in a few movies, including a kind of a B-action movie that starred not only Jason Statham, but Wesley Snipes as well, called Chaos. I thought you were going to say The Transporter Part 5. That's not even out yet. Oh, my God. You're just implying there's one coming? <laughs> Here's another uh, character, and you know I'm going to bring him in because he's introduced in one of the very first scenes. Johnny Galecki. Otherwise, plays in Big Bang Theory as I don't even know the character's name because I don't watch the show. I know it's one of the biggest shows of all time, and seeing him here, I've, I've been recognizing him from the show, and I was like, hey, that's a weird thing for him to be here to transition from this into a all-time famous sitcom, so that's mm-hmm. pretty interesting. You know us, though, Anne Heche, the weird sister in the woods. I mean, another one we know for also in this movie is uh, Bridget Wilson, I believe is her name. Sonya Blade from Mortal Kombat. Yeah. Yeah, like, I'm saying the bit roles are all well-known people. Even if they weren't well-known at the time, they all went on to have careers. It's probably it's similar to the faculty. Faculty had, like, amazing characters in supporting roles. But this also has yeah, probably but... one of the best supporting casts of a horror movie ever. So, I will say this, though. The faculty, at least those actors, tried to do a good job, and they succeeded. Oh, man. This movie, I'm sorry. They had better material to work with in faculty, though. This movie still didn't have Jack on the faculty. Well, what's crazy is it's the same writer, Kevin Williamson, who wrote Scream, I Know You Did Last Summer, and The Faculty. It's the same writer, and you can see the links there between Faculty and Scream because they both have the snappy dialogue, the, um, the teen stereotypes that aren't teen stereotypes. But I don't know what the hell happened here because there's none of that snappy dialogue in this movie. Um, the characters are one note. It's like so, he just, he was like, it was great for Scream, and then fell asleep during this. And then woke up again for faculty. Another thing I want to admit, uh, what you brought up, uh, what hap- what it is the writer doing with this movie. What I think I know the theory of that. He read the book. He enjoyed the book and then went, but it needs blood. Lots of blood and a lot more kills. Well, considering fuck the book never didn't kill a single person. Yeah. The book is from the author Lewis Duncan, who uh, this was the first book had decided to actually lend the rights out to the studios to make a movie of and Turns out she would get quite the surprise when she went to the movie theaters, saw it for the first time, and walked out halfway through the movie. Because to her surprise, she did not know they had made a slasher out of her book, which is very much a thriller slash mystery. But the movie was generic slasher. She walked out halfway through and she said to herself and to a newspaper, I will never give my rights for my one of my books to the film studios again. Agreed, because the book 
It's a good book. It's a good read. Nice mystery going on, and it has some thrills. And very well-developed characters. Exactly. However, this movie, I didn't like a single damn person except for <laughs> Moose Watson, to be honest with you. Um, Just because Moose Watson played the character. I didn't like Moose Watson. This movie came out in the summer of 1997. The December before this was Scream. So Scream came out in December 1996. This came out in July 97. So very close together. Scream ended up basically breathing new life in the horror genre. And we would then have a ser- about five years of just straight slashers making a comeback, mostly fake Scream movies. But this could not necessarily be considered an imitator because it's the same writer. And it came out six months after Scream, so it was almost like it had to be in production at the same time that Scream was in production because it came out very close together. So that may be why this movie isn't as good as Scream because he it was rushed. He may, have, he may have actually wrote this before he wrote Scream, honestly. Mm. So I hope he didn't write this before he wrote Scream. Because like I said, Scream's a great movie. If he, if he was rushed to make this one, then it kind of makes sense on why this movie is not maybe, even on the same ballpark. But maybe he wrote this, and then with Scream, he sort of found his voice. And now everything afterwards is going to be Scream quality. But this was his first thing where he hadn't found his voice yet. Because after this, everything else he did after this was very self-aware, meta humor. This movie has no no meta, no self-references. These characters don't talk about horror movies. Mm. They talk about urban legends, yeah. the damn the hook guy. But So maybe he just that hadn't become his thing yet. The one thing I'll, I'll have to look up, like, which did he write first? All right, but one thing to point out for the opening credits. As we open the movie, we do have a random character on a mountaintop hill. Cliffside. On a cliffside, basically contemplating life and looking like he's about to kill himself. While while uh, hitting a little necklace thing that spins, makes that little ding sound. It's clear this guy is allowed in his mind. Oh, yeah, clearly. And then fireworks. Because it's the 4th of July. And then, a year. and then our main characters hit a guy. Our characters hit a guy. Yes. They hit a man. Movie's over. Movie's over. Well, hold on now. <laughs> One thing we've never seen discussed before is we want to get into the legalities of what they did, what they could have done, what the possible consequences would have been if they did report themselves to authorities. Let's just frame this. We have four teenagers in the car. We have, we have Ray, played by Freddie Prinze Jr. We have Julie, played by Jennifer Love Hewitt. We have Helen, played by Sarah Michelle Gellar. And we have Barry, played by Ryan Phillippe. We have Ryan Phillippe. Or we have Barry and Helen in the backseat. Ray is our driver. Julie is our passenger who is, of course, distracting Ray and causing him to hit a man. Oh, she Good did. job, Julie. Uh, no, no, no. You definitely got that wrong. She didn't cause him to hit a man. Barry did when he got up and through the sunroof, drunk as shit, drops the bottle all over Ray. Ray is obviously looking down, trying to get him, trying to get Barry back in the car when Barry goes, <laughs> wait! <laughs> and then, wham! Now, look, that makes sense, but I feel like I'm going to be blaming Julie a lot for a lot of things in this movie. You just don't like the character. I just want to get started right now and blame her for this, too. <laughs> because she's over there giving sweet eyes, whispering sweet nothings in Ray's ear, and distracting him. That's all. So, as, since we, since you just brought up that uh, what most people haven't seemed to do uh, is bring up the legality of this. Because, obviously, the characters are worried about what's going to happen to them. Now, you did some research on the topic. Yes. So, I want you to put on your lawyer hat and tell us what happened here and what could have been the... Lawyer hat is on. So let's go with Virginia because that's if some, if we ended up doing it, that's what it would be. So what? So the punishment of it would have been one to ten years in prison and a fine of up to twenty five hundred dollars. And this would have been involuntary manslaughter. Yes. And to be honest, most likely, if it's your first offense, you call the cops yourself and reported the it, reported the incident. Most likely, it would have been a you know most likely you get the full fine, of course. But they either would have dropped it down to community service because most li- most people uh, plead out a deal. Absolutely. So it would have been possibly community service or you would have served one year in jail, w- probably out six months for good behavior. I think me and Nick would have taken the community service. But the movie takes place in North Carolina, correct? Yes. So let's so, go to their, what these specific characters would have faced in North Carolina. So these specific characters, I couldn't find anything about a fine, but I'm sure there's going to be one. Most likely. Anyway, so... Bar- Barry's family's got money. That's no problem. Yeah, Barry's family's got money. They would have faced a fine and also 13 to 16 months in prison. Oh, my goodness. 
How so, dare they? Yeah, so... Kill a man in 13 to 16 months. Wow, North Carolina. Get your shit together. Exactly. Now, it does say the defense of involuntary manslaughter is still being able to prove the death was an accident without negligence or recklessness, which we, which if you watch this movie, you can definitely tell recklessness was involved due to what Barry did causing Ray to look away from the road. There's alcohol over the car, all over the car. Mm -hmm. So the alcohol would have um, been the negligence and the recklessness would have been just their driving. Exactly. So at the speed they were driving at. So most likely the judge would have issued the fine and then the 13 to 16 months in prison, most likely Ray getting out with good behavior uh, within half that time up probably. And then Barry with his hot headed attitude probably stays the full time. Maybe adds a few more to it. Okay. So basically we're saying is that they hit the guy. They think he's dead time to make a decision guys. And Barry's pushing to cover this up, to dump the body in the water and just cover up a murder. It was just covered up basically. Yep. And remember it's not murder yet. Technically, if they cover it up, then they would be charged for murder. So right now, they're still on involuntary manslaughter. And basically, now, Ray in the movie is basically saying, we're all going to fry. This is just fear-mongering because, first of all, both girls would have been probably okay. Yeah, exactly. But even him and Barry, they weren't going to the electric chair at Mm -mm. any point and probably weren't facing life in prison, as we've seen by the, the laws there they would not have been charged with murder. Yeah, and to be honest with you, Ray, he would have, since he ended up becoming a fisherman anyway, Ray could have easily just gotten, once he got out of prison, become a fisherman. There's no, there's nothing saying his crim, any kind of criminal activity would have kept him from being a fisherman. In fact, in that town, that's probably the only thing he would have been able to do. And so basically, Ray had not much at stake. I mean, Barry... Barry had a football scholarship. Football scholarship, like. probably wanted to get out of that town, didn't want anything on his criminal record. Ray basically was going to be a fisherman, so he could have just yes. swallowed it up and took the, the rap for it. Exactly. But from what I understand from what an earlier scene, it sounded like Ray may have had a college opportunity in New York. They didn't exactly explain too much about that. That's true. We'll have to get back to that because that doesn't make sense later on. But in the moment, basically, Barry, after finding the body, Barry immediately commits to, let's get rid of the body. Yep. And the other characters, all three of them, at one point, they show some hesitancy or flat out just say, no, let's not do that. Julie's the loudest of let's not do that. Ray is kind of like, gives some hints sometimes. He's like, I don't know about, I don't know if I can do this, Barry. But Ray also is kind of enabling Barry by saying stuff like, we're all going to fry for this. There's, there's blood liquor over the car. And he says a lot of stuff to Julie, too, to convince her also. Yeah, and then eventually they all agree, even though Barry literally had to put his hands on Julie in order to get her to agree. Let's come back to that in a second, because I got some comments on that. The big thing about here is that we find out pretty quickly that, hey, guys, he's not dead. Yeah, because he reaches out, grabs Helen's crown that she had won in a beauty competition. Yes. And then, and that's when it becomes murder when they beat the living hell out of this guy to let him go, let, get him to let go of Helen and toss him in the water. That's kind of strong. They just kick him a few times and push him off the, off the dock. They don't necessarily beat the hell of him, but it's one a, of them uses a damn flashlight to whack him on the arm. This is where it doesn't make sense to me because I think they shouldn't have, inclu- they should not have included that because to me, if I'm the characters, if I'm like Ray, Julie, Helen, I'm just confused now. I'm like, wait, so he's still alive? He goes in the water, but he took his crown. He took her crown with him. So now Barry's going to jump in the water to get the crown back. Now Barry underwater grabs the crown, and we see again. Um, he opens his eyes. He opens his eyes. He's still alive. So Barry comes out the water again, and again, as the audience, you're just like, doesn't this change things? Like the guy's still alive, but they all just like say, hey, well, let's get out of here. Let's walk away. That didn't make sense to me because Julie should have been like, especially been like. He's still alive. Mm-hmm. And, and Ray and Barry should have been like, hey, let's make sure he's dead. So it's almost like a weird, they all just assume that he's dead in the water. I'm like, uh, he was alive. You pushed him in the water. What makes you think that he's dead now? And Barry, your ass is just ignoring that you just saw him alive. Right. So that didn't make sense to me. The thing with, with it where, where Barry's like, let's make a pact. We take this to our grave. He gets everybody to agree, but he gets to Julie. He's asking, you know, he gets Helen to agree. He asks Julie. She won't do it, so he chokes her against the car. Ray, come on, man. You can't let a dude choke your girlfriend. And Ray kind of comes to the side. He's like, hey, man, let go of her. 
But when he does let her go, to me, that's when Julie's like, no, nah, I'm done with Ray. He literally lets Barry Choke. put her in a chokehold and hold her hand there. And I'm like, dude, Ray, you got to fight Barry at this point. You, she's justified in just like ending the relationship. You let a guy put his hands on her. I mean, it's justified ending the relationship the minute he's sitting there saying, let's get rid of the body. E- even myself, without knowing anything about Ray, I didn't like him after this. Because any guy's like, well, like, even if Barry beats you up, right. you have to be like, get, get your hands off her. He's, him not doing that was like, kind of, you lose respect for the character immediately because you're like, well, damn, like, how's he going to fight the killer if, like, he can't even, like, stamp to Barry? <laughs> so <laughs> and I would, Barry's smaller than him, too, to be so, honest with you. So when, 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 when Barry lets her go and Ray is like, telling her, like, you know, let's just forget about it and move on, she looks at him like, I'm like, okay. They, they're not going to say it in the movie, but I'm like, this is, the, over. this is the problem. Like, why she just, like, lets him go after that? I didn't like that because that immediately makes you, like, not think highly of Ray. You're like, this is not a stand-up guy even. Mm-mm. Like, what the hell? Now like, you want him dead. I'm almost like, I'm thinking back now. I'm almost like, probably Helen actually was more trying to get Barry off her than Ray was. Oh, yeah. She seems tougher than Ray. So and it, I thought that was a fail to, if this is going to be our hero or one of our heroes, nah. Well, how about we go to one year in the future and see if they're still together when Julie comes back to town. Julie comes back to town. And because, she gets the letter. And guess what she gets? She gets a bill from a collector's office. No, her mom asks if she's on drugs. Well. And that bill's probably her drug dealer. I think so, probably. Asking for but asking for more money. No, well, actually what it is is a little note that says, I know what you did last summer. And that was from a bill collector. Yes. Because she charged up a lot of debt the previous year, and now he's coming to collect. Sounds about right. That's even worse than a well, fisherman. Well, this movie took a real left turn, because I was thinking the letter's going to be something else, but it's actually from a bill collector. So. Ah, God damn it. Okay, now, actually, no. It's actually... More predictably, it's from the killer, the guy they hit from the summer before. Well, no, originally, because they still think he's dead. They actually think he's a guy named David Egan. The young boy who they found, who body, whose body they actually found. The yes. Poli- police found David Egan. But they don't know, but at the same time, they think that whoever is trying to kill him is connected to David in some shape or form. Let's see if we go back and watch the opening scene when the dude's on the, the hillside, or the dude's on the cliff. And he's looking at the picture and all that, right? And if you cut from that to when they show Ben Willis's corpse after they hit him, do you think you in the moment could actually say that's not the same kid that was at the at the clip at the beginning? I can say that because they're wearing they different clothes. The same clothes. Right. The dudes wearing overalls, Ben Willis, right? Because mm-hmm. the movie wants you to think at this point that the same kid on the clip is the one they hit. But clearly they didn't do a good job of like they're not wearing the same clothes, they're not the same size. Clearly that's like a man they hit. Right? Yeah. So the mystery might have been a little bit better if they synced that up a little bit better to have kid on the cliff look like whoever got hit. But I know they can't do it because that's what we've been on the list. Or they just don't show us the kid on the cliff and we hear about it in a news article. Or don't or show us the kid's face, but don't show us his body, his clothes, nothing, just his face. Ben Willis's face was pretty yeah. scarred up. So or like I said, just don't show the kid at the very beginning because then you could still sit there and say, oh, they must have killed a person named David Egan. Yeah. We would not have had the connection that that is not the same person because they're wearing totally different clothes. Julie comes home, gets the letter. And then goes to meet Helen. Who is working at her dad's store? Or yes. Working at her sister's store. Well, it's her sister's now, but it's technically still owned by her dad. Her sister's just running it. And we're just going to go ahead and call her sister Sonya Blade. Sounds good, because I know her name is Elsa. I, I think Sonya Blade is a perfect good... It's Bridget Wilson. So the actor Bridget Wilson, who's both known from Billy Madison... And was great in Mortal Kombat at Sonya Blade. And Elsa seems like an asshole. We get a little bit of character development for Helen because we know she had gone to tr- she had gone to New York to try to become an actress. It didn't work out. And she's immediately back at her store. Living the shit life is what I'm going to say for her. Yeah, I think... Because she's pretty much under her sister's thumb at this point. Yeah, we can tell basically her life is not going according to plan, what she had in her mind when she won that beauty pageant. Because she's still in the small town, living with her father and her sister, mm. and her sister irrationally hates her. Yeah, I don't know why. Just treats her like shit the entire movie. Every interaction is like laced with this underlying "I hate you." Is you, it because Sarah Michelle Gellar won a beauty pageant and Bridget Wilson didn't, or <laughs> did Sarah, or is it because Sarah Michelle Gellar is a badass vampire killing machine? I think it's number three. When Bridget Wilson was a badass, had, was a badass. Only had. One damn fight 
in the oh. whole movie. Oh, you're you're blaming her for the writing of Mortal Kombat? Get out of here. Yes. So what if she got taken hostage by Shang Tsung? She whooped Kano's ass in that first Mortal Kombat movie. And she did a lot in Annihilation, but we won't talk about that because that I was about goes to say, that one, time. that wasn't even Bridget Wilson. <laughs> oh, God, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Just remind me of the horrible casting in Annihilation. Oh, don't worry. We'll get to that eventually. But isn't this, isn't this crazy that you have just pure casting coincidence? You have Buffy the Vampire Slayer's sister with Sony Blade. Sounds about right. But anyway, how about we go to where they finally go meet Barry and they talk to Barry about what's going on. And Barry says, uh, rather pointedly, he says, I know she last summer. Ooh, what a crock of shit. Yeah, because they did a lot of things last summer. Yeah, but you know. And then she brings up, but only one murder comes to mind. <laughs> I don't think a core character trait for Barry's is intelligence. Because the guy says stupid stuff and comes to dumb conclusions and pretty much acts stupid the entire movie. And this is the start of it. Ooh, when he that, attack- could mean, ooh that could mean anything. Actually, I think the start of it is when he attacks Max, when Max could have just been like, okay, now I'm calling the cops on you because you just threatened me with a fucking hook. The leap to like, well, okay. I guess why, why Barry assumes Max, because Max was there that night. He stopped with his car, so he could have seen something. So I guess Max is suspect number one. That's cool for our mystery. But yeah, he goes and threatens Max at his job. That's not smart, dude. Nope. I know it's a small town and all, but a small town means everybody knows who you are. And that also means you get arrested, your family, you just dishonored your family. Dishonored your family, dishonored your cow. You dishonored everything. Well, the truth is, if Max was targeting you... What you did, what you just did, would make him want to target you more. <laughs> right. You probably just, if the end, you probably just escalated shit. Well, now we find, well, then we meet uh, Ray, find out what he's been doing this whole year. He became a fisherman. Yep. So let's cut to Max's death. Wait, 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 though. Let me stop it just that, because we were talking about Ray going to New York earlier. Harry says clearly to them that he's been a fisherman for about a year. That means immediately after killing the man, he didn't go anywhere. He just became a fisherman. He's been in the town the entire year. Yep. Before we even get to Max, though, we do have what's going to be the first of many awkward interactions between Ray and Julie, Julie, because their uh, their relationship is in shambles. And as Ray tries to put the pieces back together, I'm cringing as Julie says to him, I don't blame you, but I don't want to know you either. <laughs> I don't want to know you either. And she runs off crying. What? <laughs> Kevin Williamson, you wrote this dialogue? It does, I, it's hard to believe, man. First of many cringe moments. So, to be honest, it probably would have made more sense if it was uh, the, this kind of dialogue between Ray and Julie. Julie! Ray! Julie! Ray! That would have been better than what we saw. <laughs> All right, we're supposed to care about these characters in the relationship. And we I, don't give two shits. I don't care about it because I already seen Ray let another man choke her. So I'm already like, right. Ray, you already kind of broke the camel. You broke the back of the camel hair, basically. That you can't get back together with her. But we're going to see these awkward interactions all throughout. Now we can get to Max's death, which I didn't like. So the reason uh, Vic doesn't like this, to be honest, I don't like it either. So we're supposed to establish, we're, we've been kind of established that whoever this, the slicker man is, I'm going to call him slicker man, even though they call him fisherman. Whoever the slicker man is, Slicker, really just, slicker man sounds cooler. Yeah, really just wants a uh, revenge against these characters for wronging him in the by uh, allegedly killing David Egan. And he's justified because they wrongfully hit him on the road mm-hmm. and try to cover it up. So well, we're almost the, the hitting him on the road was the accident. What they wronged him with is by leaving him for dead. Yeah, putting his body in the water, basically. Instead of doing what legally would be the right thing to do, they decide to cover it up. So you're almost, at this point, you're like, well, hey, whatever happens now, they kind of deserve it because this fisherman, slickerman guy, I mean, he has a reason to be mad. Yeah. And that would make the whole movie more interesting if he's guided by his revenge for these four people. But they kind of get off track on that. Yeah, scene. especially with this scene, because Max did nothing to this guy. The close. The only thing they can say is he has some form of connection with Julie. That, to be honest with you, Julie doesn't give two shits about this guy. No, she hasn't talked to him in a year, and probably will never talk to him again. Exactly. Uh, so, the, the so apparently the, the slicker man decided to you know grab the hook from him, and instead of leaving the area, decides Max's collateral. What doesn't make sense to me is Max is like the number one suspect. 
Why not keep him as a suspect? When, when you kill him, he's no longer... You can't pin the murders on him. You could well, actually theoretically pin the murders on Max. Well, I guess, to be, theoretically, also, Slicker Man wouldn't know that Max was a suspect with them. Because he's not exactly stalking them at this point. He's not near these characters to hear what they're saying. How would the Slicker Man even know that Max was there that night? He was unconscious when they were rolling his body away and Max stopped. Right. So... And then when they come and accuse him, are we assuming the Slicker Man is like within hearing distance and actually hearing the whole conversation? Well, no. He, he would have to be already there when Barry comes to confront Threaten Max. Him. Yeah. So he's already there in the back room listening. How does he know anything about Max? It's all. So, and then he kills Max in, in public during the day, basically. So There's I, guess, other workers there. I guess I slightly know the theory. The theory is since we find out that the Slicker Man is Ben Willis, who is a fisherman. What it is is Ben Wills is bringing in his load from a fish hall, overhears what's going on between them, and then decides to kill, to Max. kill Max instead of, okay, you're right. It still wouldn't make no damn sense on why he would kill Max knowing full well he's the suspect. I It's like, it's to me, like, Max is like, he's not involved enough to warrant him dying. No. He's really just, literally, you're saying this character is the wrong place, wrong time. He happened to drive by. And he happens to be a they he happens to be confronted by Barry, and that leads to him getting killed. But I think that the death is just bold because this dude is just gonna be like do all the stuff in this movie. That's like, why risk it? Stay in the shadows. You're coming to a public workplace and killing him. Yeah. What day. What would have happened if say one of his coworkers just walked right through? Because I'm guessing Max isn't a fisherman himself. He's one of the people who takes care of the loads. Yeah. And even that. What if Max just saw him walking towards him? The dude's walking towards him in slow motion with a hook, but if Max sees them, he can easily run away. Exactly. He's relying on Max not seeing him. It's just one of those, okay, it's like, okay, oh, now this is not going to be a mystery. This is like a slasher movie. This and is, this this is, is the, probably where... This is up the, the body count. And this is where the author walked out of the theater, I'm sure. This first kill, she was like, oh, wow. Because at the beginning, we're like, oh, this is going to be a good mystery. But this first kill is like, oh, she... Because her, car- her killer... Not even her killer... Her person in the book who was the guy who was taking revenge, like, felt justified, had a reason to be mad at these four characters. And also, well... But he wasn't going around killing people. No. He didn't kill a single person in the book. In fact, he was trying to, instead of killing them, he wanted to ruin their lives in one shape or form that didn't involve actual death. Yeah. The the killing of Max is the first um, breakage in logic because now this is no longer a character who's justified his revenge. Because he's killing people that had nothing to do with that night. It's no longer revenge now. You're just on a killing spree. Yeah. So. So. But from Barry's perspective, he feels like, hey, I bullied Max. It's all over. Have a great rest of your life, guys. I'm going to go to the gym, train, and almost die by Slicker Man taking my car and ramming me down with it. Now, Slicker Man, apparently in this scene, is definitely Jason. Because <laughs> he gets around with cat-like quickness. And it can be disappear at the at moment's trace. And I'm just going to say this. My problem with this scene is that this is not Slicker Man just fucking with a dude. Mm-mm. He hit him with a car. It sent him crashing through what I could see as an entire deck, basically. And the entire deck collapsed on Barry. If Barry's going to die, this should be his death scene. <laughs> <laughs> this is way a way better death scene than eventually what happens. And you can't tell me that Slicker Man just, like, sending him a message. You basically killed him like you you ran him over into a, a damn warehouse the fact that he happened to be alive afterwards is just a damn miracle no uh, and even barry himself because uh julie said that someone tried to kill you barry tells him like no if he wanted to kill me he had his opportunity <laughs> I, they, I he just wanted to scare me they, that was so the line it's like when they were like filming it they were like okay okay so he's gonna do something to barry He's not going to kill him, but he's sending a message to him. So what can that be? And somebody like on the staff was like, okay, let's have him run him over the car, right? But then he flies through the warehouse, and the entire wooden deck collapses on him. But then Barry will go to the hospital, and he won't be paralyzed. He'll be out the hospital the next day. Yeah, which— the, And someone was like, oh, brilliant! Which, the reason we bring up the whole him not being paralyzed is because in the book, Barry was paralyzed at the end of that. At the end of that scene, he was paralyzed and actually left in the hospital through the rest of the book. Oh, from that scene, from what we saw, that car, car crash, 80% of people would be dead, but the 20% probably paralyzed. Exactly. Barry is out of the hospital 
the next day. What the hell? Damn good doctor. They got Doctor Strange to heal him. I, I just... This scene is too dumb because, again, Ben Willis, if, if the point is to send a message, you basically destroyed him. <laughs> like, you were trying to kill him here. I'm not buying you weren't trying to kill him. You wouldn't run him over the car if you were not trying to kill him. So, anyways, but this was... This should have been his death scene. That's all I'm saying. So, now Julie decides... Okay, this is getting dangerous. I'm going to find out who this David Egan really was. So Julie and Helen goes to see David's sister, Missy. Who is, for some reason, just randomly the creepiest woman of all time. Yeah, they. That, there's no reason for this. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I get that she's traumatized by her brother dying, but there's no reason for her to be basically Norman Bates in the woods. And what's bad is every time she enters the scene, she kind of jumps out at you, and then all of a sudden she's a normal fucking person. It's like... And this I, doesn't make sense. And I get they were doing, but they've already messed up because they already showed the slicker man being a man. Yeah. They showed a man's face, man's boots. If you hadn't done that, then you're almost like, oh, she that she's the killer. She's creepy. Which but, also would have kind of coincided with the book when you find out the you know, the villain of the book was David Egan's brother. Yeah. So what they're presenting is traumatized, her life is ruined, uh, sad character. Go do that. So why add in the also, the creepy, psychotic, oh, she might be a killer self actor. Just, again, weird writing. Yeah, it is. Um, after the visit, uh, let's just keep the name Billy Blue in mind, by the way, people. Billy Blue. Let's keep that in mind because it will somewhat come to play later. It, make, it honestly doesn't give two flying fucks, but it comes into play. I guess you could say that. Anyway, so Slicker Man walks into Helen's house. Wait through a his minute. Front door, what? Through the front door. Okay. All right, Slicker Man, I'm, I'm trying to get in your head to understand what, what you're thinking here, right? He's you, thinking he's going to cut off Sarah Michelle Gellar's hair. That's not good enough, right? He's outside the house. Yes. The door is closed. Yes. You don't know what's in the house. Mm-hmm. And you just walk in. What if you walk in and the dad stand there with a damn shotgun and blows you away, as he should because you're, you're trespassing in his house? Or Bridget Wilson pulls off her Sonya Blade skills on you. Hey, she's getting back to civilized life. She's a civilian now. She hasn't been Sony Blade for a couple years, but if she sees Slicker Man, she says, hey, okay. Took out Kano, got to take you out too. Yep. Instead, Slicker Man gets extremely lucky, walks in, Helen's in the f- kitchen, and her dad's on the couch. By the way, what's up with her dad where he doesn't even acknowledge her when she says hello? Was hey, there something going on he, there? I'm guessing he drunk. I'm sorry, if you're drunk out of your mind, he probably fell asleep with his eyes open. Yeah, but I think they were trying to say something about their relationship with their father's bad. But Slicker Man walks up the stairs. Again, Slicker Man, when you walked in, you, you didn't see what's going on, right? You just walk up the stairs. There's three people living in this house. Aren't you afraid someone's going to see your ass? And if someone does see you, what was the plan? They just kill everybody in the house? I guess. But this is all the warning stage. He doesn't want to kill them yet. He's just effing with them. He can't kill them until July 4th, the anniversary. So this is all just him messing with them. I'm just saying Slicker Man is like doing some bold shit that no killer would do. Like, or shouldn't do. It sounds like, like silly. Like you don't walk into a house with people in there. But you just don't do it because you don't know if the dad has that gun in the house. Your hook is cool, but the gun will shoot you, my friend, <laughs> and you will die. Hey. Anyway, that was pet peeve. And then, and then he hides in the closet, Yep. and he gets super lucky. Again, if she, if she opened the closet and he's there, does I'm, he just kill her? I don't understand. So I'm assuming she just falls asleep in, her, in the clothes she was out in. Okay, slicker man. <laughs> I'm sure you have delicate hands. You're telling me you're going to run the risk of actually cutting her hair while she's sleeping. She with the idea, sleeper. with the idea that she's not going to wake up. She's a heavy sleeper. I, this How is, does she fight vampires? Vampires normally come out to people and, while they're sleeping and go nom noms. Yeah, this was a this this stretched the realm of believability that in the middle of the night he comes out the closet, chops off her hair, writes something on her mirror, and then leaves. And, yep. and nobody in the house notices. She doesn't know she doesn't wake up. Did she take some damn Benadryl before she went to sleep? I guess the so. The sleepy nighttime Because rem- remember, you can't have the sniffles if you're in a coma. What he actually chopped off was just her fake hair anyways. Yeah, well. So, good job. Yep. So, uh, Julie finds Max's dead body in the trunk of her car. First of all, Slicker Man, very busy guy. So, we to assume after leaving Helen's house, then walked over. Well, actually, he would have to walk to get Ray up. He'd have to go get Max's body. Let's assume he has a car now. Mm-hmm. We don't see a car, but mm-hmm. because he has a he has a boat, the fisherman, right? So the boat has wheels. All right, he takes the boat onto land on the street, 
<laughs> goes down the street in the boat, paddles his way along, <laughs> gets to Julie's house. Julie's car's parked there. Julie's in a very domesticated neighborhood, and he has na- there's neighbors there. There's an HOA. There's windows, neighbors with windows. My man can't move her car, so he doesn't have her keys. So right there, proceeds to put Max's body and a bunch of live crabs in the car. In the yes. Car. Sounds logical to me. He's getting away with a lot, man. One car driving by that neighborhood might have just gave the whole thing away, but damn, I guess not. Anyway, so uh, now we get our what are you waiting for line when she oh, goes back to the car. God. When she goes back to the car with with Helen and Barry and finds Slicker Man. Explain has... to me how the hell. <laughs> <laughs> she went and got, she went right down the road to get Helen and Barry. Yes. They come back in a rush panic. Yes. All the crabs are gone and the body's gone. Yes. The car, again, is parked in the broad daylight in the middle of the street. Yes. Slicker Man rushed to the scene and did what with the body? Put yes. It, put it back in the boat and paddled along. Yes. What the hell? I'm starting to think he has an accomplice. I'm thinking, like, who's more efficient, him or Predator? <laughs> I think he's a better kill than Predator from what I'm seeing. Yes. <laughs> Maybe his damn son is helping him out in this movie. Allegedly. I mean, what the hell? Apparently, what the hell else would his son be doing? In this? All right, anyways, going to college. So for art, what are you waiting for? I, I can't, waiting for this movie to get interesting. I can't believe again that someone wrote, someone on set was watching the scene and didn't think it was the most over the top cringe thing ever. So I get the strange. Does she actually? Who is she talking to? Okay, something tells me. If I remember correctly, I think I heard that that was actually improv. There's no way. I will not blame her for this. <laughs> so Barry and Helen go to the parade as usual. Julie goes to Missy and Ray disappears for the rest of the damn movie till the end. Now, what leads to this is very annoying to me because, uh, first of all, <laughs> Ray tackles an old man or Barry. No, tackles no, 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 an no, old no. Man. Let's go back. Go back. Go back. So after they find Max's body in the trunk, we cut to Barry beating up Ray. Oh, they, yeah. They walk up on Ray. You're going to die. And I'm like, where did the, the leap to raise the guy doing this come from from our group? Because it just didn't make any sense at all. There was a quick leap to him punching Ray and accusing him. So let's also go to how overacted Ray is. Again, wide ass eyes. Yeah. And he your, goes, well, your, your uh, I've line. gotten something too. I got a letter. <laughs> and, and Ryan probably has the best delivery with this line. He's like, oh, you got a letter. <laughs> I got ran over. Julie gets a dead body. Helen gets her hair cut off, and you get a fucking letter. That's probably the best acting right there in this it whole movie. It makes poor Ray look bad because it's true. You got a letter, and everybody else is getting like like terrorized, and you got a letter. But it again makes a suspect because what they're doing here is they're trying to make it seem like Ray is a suspect. Now they go into some weird room. No, they go into Helen's room. Yep. And they have a little meeting of the minds, which normally produces an intelligent co- conclusion. But that's not what happens here. Helen says the one smart thing, which basically she's like, absolutely not. I'm not going to the parade. Julie, the friend that she is, says, no, you got to be there in case he shows up. And Helen says, I don't want him to show up. And Julie says, well, guys, we have to face this. And then Ray says, yeah, let's do the smart thing. Let's get out of town. I'm done running, Julie says. We're going to face this. So Julie gets everyone killed. Julie gets everyone killed because Helen, her smart instinct was, I'm going to stay in the house. And Julie's like, oh, well, you, should, you have to go in case he shows up. I don't want him to show up. At this point, the, the friends should honestly be sticking together. Not splitting up. Wait, this, there's one smart thing you can do here. Stick together. First of all, uh, commit to staying together for the day because Julie correctly says this is his one-year anniversary. Whatever he's, whatever he's planning is going to happen today, July 4th. So you know that. Okay. Go buy a gun. You all stay together in one location with a door. You sit in front of the door with the gun, all of you together. Yes. But Julie says, hey, you guys do this. I'm going to do this. And she gives no directions to Ray, which means Ray just goes to chill on his well, boat. From what, I underst- movie. from what I understood, she did uh, ask Ray to go with her to go see Missy. And he says no, because he had a fling with Missy. I was going to say plot twist. He's Billy Blue. Yeah. So he had a fling with her. Do yeah. you, you see that Missy hinted at that they were a thing? Yeah. Like they were an item for a short term. Mm-hmm. Um, weird. But yeah, so basically Julie gets everybody killed because sh- they all correctly were like, okay, let's leave town. No. Let's stay in the house. No. You do this. I'll do this. Like, 
you can get your friends killed because they did not want to go to this damn parade or do one. Then we get Barry tackling an old man, an old man, a cardiac arrest because he tackles him. And Jewel, and then in another scene, Julie realizes they didn't kill David because oh. David had the exact same letter as Julie had gotten. And she even tells Missy, this isn't a suicide note. This is a death threat. So Slicker Man had originally sent a d- young David a letter also. Yes. But David was on that cliff to kill himself. Yes. So are you re- saw it. So are you ready for Barry's death? Because you were hoping for a big epic fight. Between mixed martial artist Barry and Slicker Man. Well, let me just give you a quick hypothetical. I want to get your opinion on this. Okay. Okay. You're Barry. Okay. Um, your girlfriend tells you that, hey, I just saw the guy at the parade. Yes. He had a big hook. Yes. This same guy with hook already ran you over. Yes. You're one day out of the hospital. Mm-hmm. You're at this uh, this beauty pageant now yes. with Helen. Watching a bunch of half-naked girls. Small town, so everybody in this town probably knows about this pageant. Yes. Knows that Helen won in last year. Yes. So knows that she's likely to be at this pageant. Yes. So you're Barry. You know this. Yep. Of all things you can do, because we saw that the pageant has a backstage area. Mm-hmm. And you were just in the backstage area with her. Mm-hmm. Makes sense to stay there. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Or would you go up to the balcony, which is isolated. Nobody else in the balcony. Mm-hmm. But in that isolated balcony, there's a door there. Mm-hmm. And would you stand facing the crowd... With the plenty of room behind you for someone to come behind you. Would that make sense to you given the circumstances of that scenario? No. Is Barry just an idiot? Yes. Because also, here's another thing. <laughs> so during this kill scene, I will admit, Barry's death scene is pretty, I'm not going to say brutal, but it, it can be scary. Because think about how many people is in that room as you're being killed right above them. And you're still not getting any help. The reason this scene definitely isn't that great is because Barry doesn't scream when he gets stabbed. I'm sorry. <laughs> I I may be down and I'm being stabbed. I'm going to scream like a little bitch to get somebody's attention. Like, hey, somebody's fucking stabbing me up here. Instead, all we get is Helen screaming bloody murder and no one believes her because when they look up, they don't see anything. This death scene is filmed so oddly to me. Okay. Really, it just looked like Barry was discomfort yes not not even being killed it's just like oh oh again really you're punching me in the gut so i'm gonna i'm gonna break it down in two different ways but the first thing is the biggest problem i have with this after all this build up to barry boxing being a tough guy doing all this stuff right i'm just not buying him you don't get a payoff for it no but even how he dies i'm not buying it he basically gives up quick the guy grabs him right okay you're blindsided i get that hits you with the hook right you fly the ground there's still a, a, a solid window there for you to like get your bearings and realize you're being attacked. What they show is Barry lying there waiting for the guy to overtake him. And then even as he's stabbing him, there's no fight. There's no survival instinct, no fight or flight instinct. It, they cut to Barry's face. It looks like he's like turning away. Like he doesn't want to see himself getting stabbed. So he's just turning away. And you're right. Just being like, oh man, I'm getting stabbed. Also a fish hook. I'm pretty sure that's fucking painful going in you. Like I said, I'm pretty sure he should be letting out more yelps than just, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> no, but they show his face. He doesn't look like he's in pain. No. He looks like he's actually watching. More annoyed. It feels like there's something on TV that's like like making him cringe. Mm-hmm. So he's turning his face to avoid it. It's, it's really weird. But the biggest thing is just I don't buy him getting overpowered so easily with no fight. Mm-hmm. Like, Well, it could have done with the stuff. Is, you know, have them put up a, a fight up there, get into the alleyway where then he gets blindsided maybe with something going up inside his head where he's dazed and confused and then starts getting stabbed from behind. He still lets out those yells, but because of everything going on, no one hears him. That would make for a better death scene. Because the gimmick is that they don't want anybody in the room to hear the death. They had to basically do it in a way of like, okay, you're going to kill him there, but... He's going to awkwardly not scream or do anything. Yes. Yeah, That's that... stupid. There's also a weird thing where it's like we have these on screen deaths, but then we have some deaths that are just off screen. Like they didn't want to show him actually hook him. Right. Which would have made more sense if he's attacking from behind. You would want to make it as quick and kill him as quick as possible. The strategy of I'm going to hook him like four times. That's you're opening him up to scream. Again, what was, right. the, what was the killer's plan? Right. What they could have done is, you know, killer 
grabs him from behind real quick, pulls him away from the awning so that way when he does bleed, it doesn't go on somebody, shoves a hook right in his face. Yeah, and I know this is not ideal for Barry, but given that situation, even if I'm scared, right, honestly, I'm figuring out a way to jump off the balcony. Because I'd rather fall off the balcony to the ground and take my chances with that than if I'm so not going to fight the guy. Helen, of course, she witnesses it. No one believes her. So a cop decides, I'm going to take you home. And then she curses out the cop, you know, as you do, because you want the cop's help. Okay, I don't know the logic there. No, I mean, <laughs> she's mad because she knows Barry's obviously dead. And the cop is kind of being an asshole about it. But but if you want the same cop's help, I don't think cursing him out, calling him a bunch of, you know, small town redneck names is going to help your Yeah, cause. but in, in her defense, <laughs> this cop proves to be as incompetent as she's thinking because... Given how he dies, he couldn't help anybody. He couldn't help an old woman cross the street. This guy's fulfilling the stereotype. This guy, another useless cop in a horror movie. Fair. So they. So here's another thing. So they're driving. Yes, it's a parade going on. Yep. But they come across a barricade. A barricade that you can definitely tell is one of those plastic barricades they put in front so no one can drive through. Um, you're a cop. Move the barricade. Move the barricade. And then when you drive through the barricade, move it back. Instead, he goes, oh, we can't go this way. Oh, there's an alley right there. Yeah, because the barricade doesn't, there's no, it's not a scene of an accident. There's nothing going on there. He's just like, oh, a barricade. Move it. Now, had he moved it, another example where Slicker Man's plan would have been a fail. And Slicker Man makes a lot of assumptions. But luckily for him, every single one of his plans ends up coming true. Because every circumstance works in his favor, and they drive down the alleyway where Slicker Man is standing next to his car. Yep. Now, if you're Slicker Man, you're like, oh, cool, the cop's here. The cop has a gun. <laughs> what is your plan, Slicker Man? Just to, like, just to kill him while he has a gun? Like, I, this is a bold move to me. Lucky for Slicker Man, this cop is an idiot and easily distracted, and in fact, gets distracted by Helen, and just stands there until the Hooker Man or Slicker Man can walk around the car, wind up the hook, and take out Mr. Cop, giving him... In a Candyman-style fashion, I should that was a good. That was a Candyman-style kill. Yeah, because that, it, that it cop went did, into his groin, and he started ripping up. This, sir, was not the pension plan that this cop was expecting. Yeah, well, the, that was the pension plan he ended up getting. So, we get... Uh, Helen runs to the, her store. Now, wait a minute. Let me, let me frame this, though. We get an epic chase scene. It's not epic yet. It's getting there. We're about to see the next the next ten minutes. What what happens after Elsa's death is epic. But I put it all together as one thing though. Oh. Starting with the chase to the store, this is pretty epic. Helen gets chased to her store. What she does first, she breaks the cops when uh, she, they do she, know in the back. Of the cop car, there's usually bars on the windows of the back of the cop car. So when people break the glass, they can't escape through the glass. So her breaking the glass is also her breaking pretty, the glass of pretty, a cop car is also pretty in Im impressive or unrealistic or something. Right. I wasn't expecting that. Right. So because you need a good amount of force to break a cop car glass because those are usually. Uh, outfitted in case of emergencies of people breaking the glass. Well, she gets out, she starts dog. She, she gets out, she starts jogging. Luckily, Slicker Man has bad knees. Can't run. Yep, apparently. It's arthritis. I mean. So he's just he's just being all nice and walking. Slowly strolling in the park. And went and, and then, you know, Elsa's like, oh, I forgot the keys. <laughs> what the hell? Uh, Helen is knocking on the door saying, Elsa! Elsa! So here's another question. You need keys to work the inside of the door? Ah, uh, yeah. What kind of store is this? Uh, that's what I'm wondering, because usually the inside has its own little lock mechanism. The keys are for the outside. She hates her sister. Are these doors backwards? I guess. She hates her sister so much that so she's taking her dear sweet time while it sounds like she's getting attacked. Right. So she gets in. In time, but Slicker Man disappeared. This is a weird editing because you see Slicker Man cross the street. You see him coming onto the sidewalk. But yet, Elsa he disappeared. Yeah. It's a see through window. Shouldn't Elsa be able to see him in the background coming towards her? 
Anyway, so Helen tells Elsa to go lock the back door, and this is where Elsa dies. Slickerman must have already scoped out the store, because he knows immediately there's a back door that he can get into that's open. Right. Also... Why is it open? Also, here's another question for you. So this whole... The building is not the end of any of these buildings. So how... I'm just wondering, how much does this man have to walk in order to go around this set of buildings that are connected to each other to get to the back door. It takes him about 30 seconds, apparently, because... He's already inside. He gets there before Elsa gets there. Yeah. How How is her walking in the store there take less time than walking around the building? What the hell, man? Mortal Kombat. Bridget Wilson versus Slicker Man. Who's gonna... Never mind. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> Slicker Man... Is much tougher than Kano because she he takes him out one a quick fatality. Shang Tsung in the background going flawless victory. Yeah, that one really was a flawless victory. They really should have. She really should have kept her martial arts training up. Again, it was filmed kind of weird because she just stands there, she assesses the situation, and then she says, oh, "I'm gonna scream now." Ah! <laughs> and then sing backhand with th- the hook. A thankless role for we and we love Bridget Wilson. This was a thankless role. Yeah, what she should have done is. Right after uh, Mortal Kombat, she should have gotten into a vampire movie like John Carpenter's Vampire gets bitten on the thigh and then everyone's happy. And then she's going to go ahead and lose all the weight she fucking wants. You know, this movie came out the same year as Annihilation. So theoretically, she might have picked this over doing Annihilation. And even that was still the right move. <laughs> Fair. As think this role was, this would have been better than being Sonya Blade in part two. Fair. So now, now we get our epic cat and mouse with Helen... And Slicker Man. Amazing. Yes, this scene from the time she realizes Slicker Man's already in there in that building to the time she makes a stupid decision. It's an amazing scene. Why well, I, I can almost forget this I can almost forget the stupidity at the end because she's very crafty in the moment right now with what she does. Because there's at least three opportunities there where she could have been killed on the spot, but she gets away. And that's first he lunges at her. He gets away. She gets away from him. She gets to the end of the thing. She goes up the elevator thing, basically. He could have got her there. And then again, upstairs, he traps her and she jumps out the window. But each one, she got away, not because he let her, but because she actually was crafty enough to get away. And yeah. she and jumping out the window, that is her pretty much saying, fuck this. I'm going to live. Yeah. And she has better flight or fight responses than Barry did. Than everybody else in the movie. You're right. So she jumps out the window and she's now in the alleyway. Okay. You know, she walks through the alleyway. And she's still running now. Oh, well, yeah. She's running through the alleyway. The, the part that was stupid is she sees civilization. She sees people. She's almost there. She's almost safe. She stops to turn around. Yes. And that's when Slicker Man, you know, comes in. Obvious. No, 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 no. Let's let's not forgive the logic here. How the hell did Slicker Man beat her to that spot? Oh, easy. She he goes out the front door, goes down the road a little bit, and finds down the, the road where the parade is. Though yes, he would ha- either he'd be behind her or in front of her. Means that he actually had to go through the parade of people as Slicker Man. There's a lot of people in this town with slickers. That seems like a bold move, though. It may be, but at the same time, all he has to do is hide the hook, and he's just another one of the, of the townsfolk. But Slicker Man was comfortably hiding in the spot. By the time she got to that alleyway, she's looking ahead to the parade. Slicker Man's already comfortably in the spot. I don't know. That's That seems like we're getting some Jason Voorhees teleportation going on this motherfucker. No, it's called horrorportation. Okay, get it right. Pretty much, this was the only... This made... This kind of killed the character, figuratively and literally. Because the character made a stupid decision instead of just walking into the parade of people. No, 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 no. But, but theoretically, it wouldn't have mattered. She turned around, but he was in front of her no matter what. So he was gonna, she was going to run to him no matter what. Well, then they should have just showed that instead, instead of her turning around just to turn back for a jump scare. That actually became a weird trope in horror movies where you turn around. This, this was used as like a, a death scene for like 50 kills after this, the next 20 years. You turn around to check behind you and then the killer's actually behind you then yeah. on the other side. Yep. I've seen it so many times and I assume it came from here. 
Now, to, was, to her credit, the only thing she could have done was just as fast she ran as fast as she could past. Yes. Then he might not have got her. So I will say this. But she still put up a fight even the, when he got her. Yeah. This death scene is still is probably the one that actually hurts would hurt the audience the most. Just because she is a likable character, played by a likable actress, and she was the smartest one through most of this movie. Not Absolutely. gonna say all of it, she's made some stupid decisions. But 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 none but definitely not as many as Julie. Right. And definitely not as many as Ray. Right. I would say she she earned the right to live based on she has by far the best chase in the movie. She puts up the best fight. I mean, compare how she went out to how Barry went out. Barry went out like a chump. But again, for some reason. Helen looked like she was fighting to the very end. So. Oh, she was. But here's the real quick thing I'm wondering. She still didn't scream either. Why are these people not screaming when they're being stabbed by a hook? Pretty sure that's fucking painful. Because because they keep making these death scenes in public places to where, to protect the killer, we have to have our victims, like, you be could, quiet. Oh, you I'm going to kill you, and you're going to be quiet while I do it. You could have still <laughs> said, as she was screaming, that the parade was so loud no one heard the scream. That would have been plausible. Yeah. But, we, but still no scream. As an audience watching a movie, we should have heard the scream and the parade play and see, and, you know, sound that... It's the same wavelength, so that way there's the parade, people in the parade would not have been able to hear it. If she screamed and one random drummer was like, hey, what's going on over there? That itself would have took out a bell. That would have eliminated Slickerman's whole thing. So. Yeah, but at the very least, it still makes more damn sense. Yeah, I, I, again, the death thing, her death was, again, they made it off screen, though, basically. Yeah. Again, it was it was very off screen. It was very confusing what was happening anyways. So. Right, because you could definitely see that the hook was completely missing her but blood was showing i was like um it seemed okay. like it seemed like the first five times he did the hook she blocked it with her arms right so i was i, I got to point where i was kind of like it's like well i mean her arms are gonna hurt <laughs> <laughs> but she seems to be blocking everything so right so so julie now runs to the, sh- the shipyard to find ray and she even tells him straight up the killer has been willis we didn't kill him he's still alive and Ray is skeptical hippo. And then she looks down, sees the words Billy Blue, and then for some reason, even though she knows who the killer is, she just told him who the killer is, she goes, It's you. You're Billy Blue. You're you're the fisherman. And she takes off running as only she can run. Yeah, she figured it out, but then she dished her own thing to be like, wait a minute. No, you're the killer. It's like What? Well, what was Where's all... the logic? Yeah, what's all that stuff about uh <laughs> Yeah, how does that make sense with what else you figured out? Right, so Moose Watson finally makes a real reveal, not just in the Slicker outfit, makes a real reveal. Slicker man actually now becomes Ben Willis. Yep, and he pulverizes <laughs> Ray's chest with just his, you know, With his out. bare hands. Yep, and instead of killing Ray, he tells Julie, get on the boat, checks to see if Ray's okay, and then gets on the boat. So Julie... Being the wise person she is, immediately trusts this guy and goes on the boat. And then, to her dismay, starts finding some articles suggesting, some pictures suggesting that, hey, maybe this is the killer. And, suge- and his little monologue pretty much saying, you "No, know, young people like you should be out there having fun, running people over, getting away with murder, things like that. And it's like... By the way, on the wall, he has a picture of Helen from two hours earlier... This is pre-cell phones. This man took a picture, got the film Polaroid. developed. He he went to the, no, I don't. No. I'm just saying that's that's pretty real time. He has pictures of like that day, like an hour ago. So now we get our climax, climactic scene. It's a cat and mouse between Ben and Julie. Ray gets on the boat and then it, it turns almost into a sound, fist fight. It sounded like you were about to say Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> it's a cat and mouse eating ice cream. Yep. And then you get then when Ray gets on the boat, it turns into a fist fight. Between Ray and... Why is Ray now all of a sudden able to fight? Oh, he can't fight Barry, but he can fight Slicker Man Ben Willis, who's actually bigger than Barry. And is obviously a better fighter because he's beating the hell out of Oh, Ray. yeah. Let's say this. Ray gets ass kicked, though. Oh, yeah. And he, Ray even tries to use a damn harpoon a harpoon on him. He's sitting there trying to stab him, which, okay, smart move until, you know, Ben Willis has better reflexes. Yeah. Wait a minute. And... And Julie, this whole time, basically, when he's going after Julie, Julie decides, instead of jumping off the boat, 
she decides to go underneath the boat into some weird hiding area. Yep, with a bunch of ice. Why didn't she jump off the boat? Because she's probably she probably can't swim. They should have established that because <laughs> any sane person, if there's a killer on the boat, take a chance in the water. Also, to be fair, don't don't ask me why how I my theory is she can't swim when she lives in a fishing village. Fishing villages, everyone should be able to learn how to swim. Yeah. <laughs> then Julie comes out, sees Ray fighting Ben, and she goes, Ray! And Ray just looks at her, wide eyes. Good job, and, Julie. Yep. I'm just want to say something. Julie never, never, during a fight, calls someone's name and distract them because uh, your boyfriend gets knocked right the fuck off the boat. But luckily... Only with a backhand, though. Yeah, luckily he's hanging on to the boat, though, as it keeps going, because yeah. Ray suddenly has become... Jason Bourne? No, not Jason Bourne. Because he just got his ass kicked. Tommy Jarvis. Anyway, so... So Julie does nothing to actually kill the bad guy. Julie does nothing this entire fight. It's always... It's actually... The whole thing is Ray. All this, Julie did was stand there, be the bait, and then Ray throws a, uh, a hook right into Ben Willis. He is... He tries to kill Julie again by saying... Next time, if you're going to leave a man for dead, make sure he's really dead. And then he brings his arm up to hook her, and his hand gets stuck in the rope. Ray hits a button to make him go up. He loses his hand. He falls in the water. He's dead. He's not dead. He's not dead. And they know he's not dead. By the way, Ben Willis on the boat. How about Ben, Will, how about ben Willis guilt-tripping Julie about covering up a murder it's like buddy you just killed half the town <laughs> we've been watching the movie buddy you're not mr innocent trying to play it cool like oh you're just on a revenge tour yeah well you killed a bunch of innocent people who had nothing to do with anything yeah but anyways at the end we have ben willis's hand they find the hook in the hand which i don't know how the hand got on the net but but even if even though they find nobody julian julian ray decide hey everything's okay now his yeah. body will turn up eventually and the cop asks do y'all know why this man will try to kill you and they say, no. All that time lecturing Barry for nothing. Right. You guys were just as bad. Where the fuck is your morality at at this point? Well, and you would have got off easier because you could say, hey, we didn't actually kill him because he was obviously alive. He just came back and killed us. And most likely sense. because he tried to kill them, they would have been let off with just a slap on the hand because of their trauma they just witnessed. And at that point, you can just blame Barry because you can say Barry was driving the car because Barry's dead and can't account for himself and give his own account. Of the I mean, that's a dick move to do, but yes. Yeah, hey, Barry was a dick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to forgive Barry just because he's dead now. But So after everything they went through, they still won't tell the truth. So what did these two characters really learn? Where was the story arc? Of these characters, Julie was a shy and wanted to do the right thing to... Well, they weren't meant to learn anything. Uh, Nick, this was actually all about their romance and getting, getting them back, getting these two kids back together, getting these two crazy kids back together. And what we saw at the end was a little bit of a cringe because Ray says, nobody gets me like you. And Julie responds with, I understand your pain. Cut to hug. And I'm just basically about to gag. Do you really want to talk about that ending scene? Because it really makes no sense. The ending shower scene. So, I cut to one year later, and Julie is as happy as could be. Even though she got her friends killed, and she got people in the town killed, she's actually happier now than she was before. But apparently, Ray is now in New York. She's talking on the phone, and she mentions New York. So, that makes me surmise that Ray had only became a fisherman to stay in that town because he's waiting for Julie to reunite with her. So, it was all that... Got his wish. But, unfortunately for them, somebody still knows. Jump scare cliffhanger. And I think it's Barry. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. But, hey, they got to step a sequel. Yeah, they do. Even though they then tie this into the sequel in a very stupid way. Well, this was ends up being a dream sequence. So. That's why. Sarah Michelle Gellar. I really wish they would have just had her be the main character. It would have been a fun twist to have Julie get killed and have her be the heroine at the end. And to make it very twisty, you could have had her and Ray be the final two. It doesn't have to be her and Barry. Her and Ray, no romantic thing there, just they have to be the last two alive, would have been amazingly interesting. Oh, fuck it. Just kill Ray right before Sarah use, like wraps him up in the... Uh rope instead of him losing his hand wraps him up in the rope around his neck and brings it up to hang him listen ray was busy 
on the boat watching TV shows for the last, maybe he was watching Supernatural for the last half of the movie because he definitely disappeared from the movie. Remember, Julie gave everybody orders like, right, y'all two, go to the parade. I'm going to go do this. Ray was just left to go watch TV shows. Well, and again, remember, that, so. Ray, she originally asked Ray to go with her and he said, no, this is crazy. But she could have gave him, he could have been doing something productive than just chilling on his boat. Go buy a gun, Ray. Go yeah. buy a gun, please. Final thoughts, well, I guess, since I brought it up, I'll say it. So this movie is definitely one of those movies, if you sit there and think about it, you will not enjoy a single bit. You'll probably be more pissed off it than anything. Uh, if you just sit down, grab some popcorn, turn off your brain, maybe have your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your dog with you. Don't, no sheep. Cat. Um, yes, your cat too. Uh, and just sit there just to watch a movie, just see people you don't really care for get killed. This is definitely one of those movies. The set, the setting could have been fun if it was done even better. Especially with the shipyard scene, they could have done, they should have done a few more scenes in that shipyard scene, in my opinion. Agreed. And so overall, characters, the only one that I actually care for is Sarah Michelle Gellar. You know, she's a great actress. All of them are good actors and actresses now. Not in this movie. <laughs> so I'm going to give this movie, and also in respect to the author, I'm only going to give this movie a two. Wow, two, man. Well, if, if it showed a little bit more respect to the source material, it would have been a two and a half, to be honest with you, but it, it's a two. I'm leaning very closely to one and a half, but it's a Oof. little bit better than that. Damn. So, so it's a low two. You know, someone's going to send you a note a year from now saying... I know what you reviewed last summer. It's going to be an angry fan who's mad you gave it such a low rating and is going to terrorize you and kill you next I year. get the feeling that you're going to get the exact same note, too. You know, doing this podcast, there's been very few times where I came into it thinking I was going to feel a certain way and it felt opposite. But I really thought going in that this was going to be a three-star movie. I really thought so. <laughs> but I had to be honest with myself as, as I was watching it, as the flaws started to build up in my mind going through scene by scene and questioning things... Slowly, that three came down. Oh yeah. Um, look, if, as Nick said, if you turn your brain off, get some popcorn, realize that this is a, a slasher movie. There's gonna be a lot of logical flaws, story flaws. Mm -hmm. Characters are pretty one note for the most part. If you know all that going in, you will be entertained. This is not an unentertaining movie. It's a watchable, entertaining movie. You watch it with a critical eye. It's a lot of bullshit here. These characters are not well developed. The killer is basically superhuman, even though he's a guy. Ben Willis's plan is so elaborate with so many things in place that could have ruined his plan, and everything goes perfectly according to what he needs to happen. For, for example, what if Julie never came back from college? She just stayed at college for the summer. What the hell was Ben Willis going to do if she stayed at college? Kill the other three? I don't know. Without Julie, it just seems like, what's the point? So, I don't know. I'm going to go two stars. <laughs> and it, it's a hesitant because I still like the movie. I like it, I respect it, but I have to be honest about it. And that's how I'll take it. And with that, everyone, I hope you all have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your 4th of July, even though it is definitely not 4th of July when y'all are listening to this. Hell no. And you all have a good rest of your night.